Chapter 1 East End Development Many people know the story of the craze. Most know that the twins were incarcerated in the 60s for murdering two people. They were born in a time when the UK was beginning to go through a huge transition, socially and economically. The East End of London conjures up different images. It has changed a great deal since the craze era, but to go back just over a hundred years, it was a different place altogether. London in the early 19th century was dark and dingy. East London became industrialised around that time and a working class population soon became established as more people went to live there and start families. The area saw a huge growth in size and population. Conditions were poor and soon became overcrowded. The narrow streets were filthy, neglected and barely even lit at night. Prostitutes, brothels, drunkenness, robbery and assaults. It's hard to imagine what the place was like unless you were there. There were slaughterhouses, rendering plants, glue factories, engineering works, loads of breweries. With all this in the east end of London. The westerly winds would carry the stench away from the affluent west end. Leather was another growth industry so there were many tannin yards in the area. To darken the leather hides, pure was used. The charvers, wasters, scallies, losers, etc., of their day, would procure the pure of a night, which basically meant they would supply leather workers with dog shit found on the street. Now you're starting to get the picture. Dog turds on the streets... And pollution in the air. East London was also the stomping or stabbing ground of the world famous serial killer Jack the Ripper. In 1888, between Friday the 31st of August and Friday the 9th of November, he murdered and mutilated five women so savagely that it caused fear throughout the city. The victims were prostitutes in or near Whitechapel. The crimes were known as the Whitechapel murders. Once the newspapers picked up on the second and third victims, Jack the Ripper was born. He was no average serial killer. He was called that because of the way he would tear out their organs or rip them to pieces. He was never caught and has been the subject of much speculation and countless film adaptations, including from hell by the Hughes brothers. North of Whitechapel is Hoxton, or Shoreditch as it is now known. This is where another famous East End name would emerge. The name is Cray. Charles James Cray, the twins' older brother, was born in 1927 at the first family home in Gorsuch Street in Hackney. Ronald and Reginald Cray were born on the 24th of October 1933 in Stain Street. They were identical twins, born within an hour of each other. Reginald first, then Ronald, at around 8pm that night. Already with one special son, proud parents Violet and Charles Cray had unknowingly given birth to three sons that would soon etched the name Cray into the British Crime Hall of Fame. They went on to become Britain's most notorious gangsters, securing the East End's infamy for crime and violence. It's hard to pinpoint when the gangster, as we know it, came into being. The whole gangster image, as in the look, was borrowed from old American films and from infamous gangsters such as Al Capone. In London, gangsters had run protection rackets down at horse racing tracks as far back as the 1930s. Covered brilliantly in Graham Greene's novel, Brighton Rock. In the racing game is where a lot of the names you hear about now stuck out. This is where the now retired gangsters cut their teeth. These people were not fictional, they were real-life characters. 
They started their careers by working for the racketeers in one way or another. Bookmakers were offered services they had no requirement for and would be persuaded that they did need the service after all. It was usually something like having someone come around and clean the chalkboards. But those who would not comply would be made an example of and the youngsters saw from an early age that crime could pay. Most entered this long before their teens and grew up in a world of crime. Other than protection rackets, there were safe crackers and smashing grabbers, pickpockets and jump uppers, robbers who would target delivery wagons, con men, burglars, most of which amounted to not much more than petty thievery. An adept thief could earn riches. A bad thief could go to prison for further education and training. In those days, security was absent. Why should there be any? Society was unprepared for dishonesty, which enabled some astute villains to thrive. When you hear of people saying that the good old days were safe, they were not really that safe at all. It was regularly said that you could go out and leave your door open. Yes, that's true. But it's only because there was never anything worth stealing in those days. Go out and leave your front door open and someone will walk off with your televisions, computers, mobile phones and jewellery. In the good old days, you could clear an entire house for a few pence. The criminal is not a new phenomenon. Pre-war underworld activities were not a patch on what was going on in America. But just like the Americanization of many other cultures, the British criminal would soon catch on. Instead of cracking a safe with tools, thieves learned to blow the bloody doors off. That's when big money started to come in. Other changes taking place were in the police approach to solving these crimes. And now the media began to play a big part, with both TV and newspaper coverage. Still at the time, guns were unheard of. They were available, but there were still certain rules to adhere to. The police didn't carry guns, so criminals didn't. Something that would change over time. Though there weren't many professional criminals, they stuck together in the same drinking dens and were close-knit, just like all the other communities of the East End. Mentally, Ronnie and Reggie were inseparable. They had a bond, where if one of them was happy, the other one would feel it. And suffering would correspond too. But if one was around, it was assumed that the other would not be too far away. So they took on the name Twins, becoming a single entity. They would share everything, even illness. They both caught diphtheria and measles at an early age in their lives, which in those pre-vaccination times put children at high risk. So they had to be separated for the first time, taken to different hospitals. Reg recovered quickly, but Ronnie almost died of the infection. Ronnie was kept in hospital long after Reg was discharged, but Violet brought him home against the wishes of the doctors, saying he needed only her and Reg to put him back on track. Just before the outbreak of World War II, the Cray family moved to Valence Road in Bethnal Green. They lived at number 178, which had the Liverpool Street line running over the top of the back yard. Perfect for a sleepless night. Violet wanted to be closer to her own parents. When she'd married at 17, she was basically outcast by her family. The birth of Charlie eased the tension a bit and put them back on speaking terms. But the birth of the twins was the clincher. Valence Road was quite typical of its time. Overcrowded and slum. Houses had no bathrooms and toilets were always outside in the backyard. There were gambling dens, seedy pubs, billiard halls and brothels dotted all over. An area that was known for drinking, poor housing conditions, unemployment 
and a love of boxing. After the twins had fully recovered from illness, Ronnie seemed slower and more socially reserved than Reggie, finding it harder to get on with other people. He would spend time on his own or with the family pet Alsatian roaming around the bomb sites of Bethnal Green. Their illness was to play an important part in their early years because, from Violet's viewpoint, she noticed differences between them for the first time. In the family room, Ronnie would compete for his mother's attention. He felt disadvantaged in comparison to Reg, physically seeming bigger and clumsier. They would often fight each other, but would never allow a third party to come between them. Squabbling, but always sticking together. In Bethnal Green, being identical twins gave them the edge over the other little tough kids. It unnerved the others and it was something that Ronnie and Reggie used to their advantage. They became known as the Terrible Twins, and were always fighting alongside their cousin Billy, against others, against gangs, but nearly always against older boys. And they were fast learning how to handle themselves. When the war broke out, school was closed until they were eight years old. So this war-torn, derelict world provided the backdrop to their countless fights and vendettas with other kids. It was the perfect setting. Always following a fight, they would appear at home, cleaned up as if nothing had happened. So as far as their mother knew, nothing had. They were experts at keeping this side of their lives from her. This is the side of them that their father was all too familiar with, though. He was streetwise and knew exactly what they were doing. The war and no school meant they could fight in their own wars. That was their education. Without trying to sound too much like Uncle Albert from Only Fools and Horses, during the war was when crime really took off. The Blitz created many opportunities, making way for the black market. There were shortages and plenty of deserters from the war to do any dirty work for organised criminals. Rationing was introduced, and this saw a big turnaround in people's attitudes. There was temptation. Mothers wanting to provide that bit extra. People wanting cigarettes, clothes, coupons for this and that, and the criminal could cash in on it all. They would supply anything and everything and started to be viewed as heroes. This is where we see similarities with the USA again. American gangsters were propelled into the big time through prohibition. They saw an opportunity at a time when many people were tempted to break the law. Never before the war would the housewives of Britain ever dreamt of breaking the law. But now they had to provide for their families by any means necessary. It was all about supply and demand. Because of the call-up to the war, there was not a great deal of policemen around, which created a freedom for criminals to operate. There were people like Eric Mason, who essentially invented ram raiding, Eddie Chapman, the safe-breaker from the North East, another Geordie connection, once named as the most wanted man in Britain. But now criminals were starting to work as teams instead of as individuals. Two men robbing a safe could get away with twice as much money. Three or four men dressed as guards casually stealing the contents from a shop window and loading up a smart, stolen car looked more credible than one man in a mad panic. In some cases, the public even helped them load the cars up because they were that convincing. It was the birth of crime with more organisation behind it. The southeast of Britain was the centre of the war, leading to a population increase with incoming service personnel leading to an increased desire for drinking and prostitution. Bethnal Green was bombed badly during the war. For a while the brothers were evacuated to the country to avoid the devastation, but missed Valence Road too much and were soon reunited with the rest of the family to become even closer. They were an old-fashioned East End family, soaked in tradition, 
They were close, devoted and self-sufficient as families were. They had to stick together and be tough to survive. Their dad was either on the run from the law, having refused to join up for military service, or would be out earning a living. After going on the run from his service, he changed his name to continue his work. It wasn't that he was a coward. He was a product of the East End. A fighter. It just happened that he wanted to do what he was doing instead of going to war, which he had no interest in at all. He was known as a pester, a travelling trader, who would roam the country buying and selling silver, gold and clothing. He earned good money so the family was able to live slightly above the standard of most others in Bethnal Green, though he himself was never cut out to be a family man. He was well known and knew a lot of the East End villains. He became notorious for a few other activities, drinking and gambling number one and two on his list. With his lifestyle, he was seldom at home and the brothers went a great deal of their lives without a proper father. So the twins' early lives were hidden behind their mother or under her feet. They were brought up in an environment without any real male role model and were strongly influenced by their mother Violet her two sisters and their grandmother. This early nurturing in their lives moulded their way of thinking. When he was home, their dad would often comment on their lack of respect towards him. He didn't agree with the way Violet had let them do as they wanted. His solution was to discipline them. This was the way for families everywhere, but not for Violet's family. She knew from her own strict upbringing what the result would be. They would have arguments about it, with the twins close by, not missing a word. Charles later blamed himself for the twins' behaviour. He said that he should have been more authoritative and taken them out of the area. Who knows what would have happened? You could look back now and see exactly what effect it would have had on the twins. Their experiences with their part-time father increased their resentment towards authority. You can see the love for their mother, then their dad arriving on the weekend to make his mark. It was through him that they got their first taste of the underworld. Once he'd gone on the run, he would hide out with criminals and the twins would sometimes be sent with messages from their mother. Violet held the family together in the war years. She was a warm and generous woman, and looked after the three things that mattered to her the most. Her sons. She taught them values and respect from an early age, and instilled her strong sense of family values upon them. Her love for the twins was to practically smother them. When she returned to Valance Road with them as the prodigal daughter, she had an enormous sense of pride. She dressed them the same just like little dolls in a pram. Everyone was interested in them. People were not used to identical twins. With this in mind, and with their mother's love, the twins had a sense that they were invincible. She would accept everything they did. In doing so, destroying their ability to judge right from wrong. Every area of London had a reputation with the police for the difficult crimes it was associated with. Villains were known to acquire money by any means, and to have a total disregard for it once they had it. It was a means to an end, a night out, a chance to gamble and drink. They were known to live fast, die young, and leave an ugly corpse. They had a complete disregard for the family way of life and were categorically selfish. Crime-wise, it was the bank messengers, people who carried money from bank to bank, who were the target, and violence was fast becoming a way of life for the robbers. To blow a safe took skill and patience. Messengers were easy pickings, as there was little protection and minimal resistance. They would always surrender without a struggle, but would be given a few punches for authenticity. In time, 
protection increased, and so robbing them was more of a risk. Bank robbery was the next step. Jump uppers were also seeing a logical progression. They used to follow cigarette wagons and make off with a few hundred cartons. The next step for them was to hijack the entire wagon and make off with hundreds of thousands of cartons. In those days, sentences for violence and robbery was by corporal punishment and a short prison term, usually 12 months maximum. Prison was different to what it is nowadays. It was a tough regime. The twins met robbers, hijackers, fighters and racketeers through their dad. And through him, they had their first encounters with the law. On more than one occasion, they were woken up at night by police searching for Charlie Senior. Scared at first, they soon learned how to deal with them, but also picked up a fear and loathing of them. Valence Road became known as Deserter's Corner. So with all these people coming and going, the twins were constantly on the lookout for the law. It became second nature and conditioned them further with hatred towards authority. Crime in its infancy was mainly a family concern. With close communities, there would always be local families who had a reputation and stuck out from others. You could have people on your side, but if you came from a family with a few brothers, you immediately had a tight trust. That's how the Sabini brothers became the first real organised crime family in Britain. They made a name for themselves on the racetracks in the 40s. Then there was the Nashes from North London, who paved the way for two other gangs. The Richardsons from South London, who both ran powerful and fearful gangs, and of course, the Crays. They had firms made up of family, and would stand by each other through anything. Family firms would bring up reputations through fear to gain power. The power would lead to influence and so on. Brothers would start gangs or enter one as a member of the next generation. The Crays were already beginning to drift towards this way of life, though they probably didn't realise it. As children, they loved fighting and had a reputation amongst their peers. It was a reputation that would undoubtedly grow. It seems natural for it to have happened now. The Crays had rather unconventional influences in their early years, which was a major contribution to the business that they entered. Other than their dad, all the Cray family members were also well-known characters in Bethnal Green, one of which was Mad Jimmy Cray, their parental grandfather. He was a stallholder in Petticoat Lane and was famed for his drinking abilities nearly as much as his bar brawling. Their maternal grandfather, Jimmy the Southpaw Cannonball Lee, was another character. In his younger days, he'd been a bare-knuckle boxer and then a music hall entertainer. He was a one-off in more ways than one, a non-drinker, and loved to tell the twins stories of his fighting days. Family influence led the Cray brothers towards the boxing world as well. The twins' first real taste came when they were at the Victoria Park Fair in the boxing booth. Men could win money by going the distance with the in-house boxers, but not that many of them were successful, and most would be half cut to begin with and would run out of steam or be sick within a few seconds. In the interval, the organisers allowed pairs of fighters to slug it out to keep the crowds hungry for more. Ronnie was quick to volunteer himself as a contender, but there was no one else of his weight division in the crowd for him to fight. The MC was about to refuse him a fight when Reg stepped forward. They climbed into the ring and gave a no-holds-barred boxing exhibition in front of the bloodthirsty crowd. Neither would back down. They fought each other toe to toe, as though they were sworn enemies. In the end it was declared a draw. But the most important result for the twins was that the men, the fighters of the East End, were now made aware of who they were. From then on, boxing took over their lives. 
It was all there was for them. Young Charlie had been the first to put the gloves on, and the twins had watched as he sparred round after round in the backyard under the guidance of the grandfather. Although he was known as the gentler of the brothers, the training paid off for Charlie, and he went on to win a few boxing titles as a welterweight during his stint in the Royal Navy, where he carried out his national service. He was discharged from service because of severe migraine attacks, and the twins begged him to teach them the noble art. Charlie was becoming more involved in boxing and didn't need much persuading. Once they had talked Violet into giving them some space in the house, Grandad Lee set up a punch bag, an old navy kit bag filled with rags. As word spread, Violet found herself with a house full of young boxing hopefuls and more gym equipment than she'd imagined. But she loved it. The twins must have been around ten years old when they fought that first time. And then they met again in the Hackney Schoolboys Boxing Championship 1948, where Reg won on points. This was only a year or so later, and they'd come such a long way in so little time. Their dad had encouraged them to take up boxing, thinking it would discipline them and steer them away from the only other career option in the area. Hopefully, they went on to destroy everyone in their way. Ronnie was good, but only considered to be a brawler. He would just steam in, using brute force. He fought with heart and would never give up. Reg was the better of the two and was an accomplished boxer with skills and a game plan. He studied it, and saw it more as an art than an all-out punching competition. Local papers reported on the twins, and they received rave reviews after each fight. A boxing career beckoned, though it looked like Reg would be the only one to make it. They soon turned professional, but it proved to have the opposite effect on them, as to the kind one would imagine. Reg was schoolboy champion of London. He told me in later years that it was one of the proudest moments of his life. But it was the violence outside the ring that led to their downfall as boxers. They just could not help themselves. Managers were not touch a boxer with a reputation for street violence. But I don't suppose the twins saw it the same way. They were destroying everything they had worked so hard to build up. They got into trouble with the police on several occasions for grievous bodily harm and other violent attacks. The stories about their fighting on the street had become just as frequent as seeing them in the sports pages of the East End Advertiser. One attack had even involved a police officer. Up until now, they had earned respect from people following their up-and-coming boxing careers. But now, they were earning themselves a reputation as a couple of tearaways. The older generation considered the act of hitting a policeman as crossing the line. The post-war years were still uncertain times. And other than in the criminal community, this was a law-abiding area. Police were there to keep the peace and protect. Such behaviour was unknown. They were no longer known as the clean-living boxing hopefuls from the area. They had drifted into a world of violence. They narrowly escaped prison sentences each time they were on a charge. But they were lucky. For this to happen in their mid-teens, they thought they could get away with anything. Why should they believe anything different? Even with witnesses involved, evidence didn't stick and their mother was always there to believe anything they told her. Violet also looked to her family for support. Her sisters May and Rose lived on each side of her in Valence Road. Her brother Jimmy shared her home and slept on the settee, while Grandad Lee, his wife and son John, lived across the road above the calf. Violet and her parents doted on the twins, as too did her sisters. They all wanted to be seen with the twins because of their uniqueness in the community. Everyone has a favourite auntie, and Auntie Rose was the twins. Famously, Aunt Rose told Ronnie his eyebrows were too close together. She told him that it was an omen, 
She said it was because he was born to be hanged. She loved them, but apparently had a bit of a temper and would often fight with other women, or anyone really, in the street. Years later when she died, it was said to be the catalyst that finally tipped Ronnie over the edge, sending him into the world of madness that had been following him. Maybe this is true. It would certainly appear to be a contributing factor. A sudden loss of a loved one can affect people in different ways, and there may well have been other elements adding to his state of mind. Charlie married his childhood sweetheart, Dorothy Moore, in 1948. They moved into number 178, which meant converting the gym back into a bedroom. The twins didn't get on well with their sister-in-law, and as Charlie spent more time with her, a space between the brothers began to grow. But boxing would always be their bond. In December 1951, all three brothers appeared on the same fight card at a middleweight boxing championship held at the Royal Albert Hall. This was massive and attracted more attention to the brothers, though the results were not as they would have hoped. Charlie lost his fight, Ronnie got disqualified and Reg won. On the 2nd of March 1952, the twins were called up for national service. Everyone had to do it. All fit men over 18 were called up for two years. Fit being a loose term. How do you think Mr Fraser became Mad Frank? Because he was unfit, of course. The twins were now Royal Fusiliers. For a day. They went AWOL to see their mam, only to be brought back the following day. Their service to the country meant A, doing a runner whenever they could, or B, they were locked up for doing a runner. Military service was just another authority figure that they had no respect for. Part of their service included a nine-month stretch in Shepton Mallet Military Prison, where they were able to meet up with like-minded people. For all they hated the army, though, it did teach them something. Without their service, they would not have been able to organise people and plan strategically for their own battles on Civvy Street. It also led them to meeting and working with various criminals while plotting their escapes and hanging around with them once they had escaped. This was the best networking they could have done. And it was their dad who made the first introductions, and it took off from there. On the run, they would go to a club called the Royal, where the local gangs would turn up in strength to show who was number one. Fights were almost compulsory. Again, this was the twins' means of paving the way for themselves once their time was up. They were proving themselves as a force to be reckoned with, as well as having the balls to do so while on the run. They were finally dishonourably discharged from the army and could now go about their business. Fighting was now a way of life. They enjoyed inflicting pain on their victims and would always take fights to the extreme. They would use weapons without a second thought and now own their first gun. They leased a billiard hall called the Regal in Eric Street off the Mile End Road in Bethnal Green. It was open all hours and became the meeting place for criminals whom the twins had built friendships with. The lease was taken out for three years at five pounds a week and came about as a result of ridding the place of some unsavoury characters that had been harassing the previous owners. This may have been good fortune or good planning. It was their first step into their new world and it meant they could now start to write their own set of rules. It seemed quite fitting that they had a place called the Regal. Now they had their feet firmly on the first rungs of the criminal ladder. Ronnie had now developed the image he'd been dreaming of and reading about for years. He started to dress gangster style. The big chunky jewellery and the wide-shouldered suits, crisp white shirts and tightly knotted ties. He was adapting a lifestyle that went with the job too. He'd sit in his own chair, soaking up the atmosphere at the club. 
to anyone now, it was obvious that the twins had big plans for themselves. They would fight anyone at any time and never lost. Always on the move and never seemed to rest or sleep. Ronnie was now at the forefront as the dominant twin. He had a network of young boys who were his information service, keeping their ears to the ground on his behalf. This was where he got the nickname, The Colonel, because of his ability to organise and lead people, building up his own arsenal of weaponry, which was kept hidden at Valence Road. Ronnie would show no apparent weakness. The only weakness he had was for young boys. He never showed an interest in women, but with boys he was gentle, a different person altogether. One thing he could not be in this environment was a homosexual. Not openly. In such a world as the one they were entering, it was unheard of. Ronnie didn't really want for much and had what was basically a simple life. Living at home meant cooking and ironing was done for him by Violet. He had manicures, massages, you name it. It was his very perception of the gangster. He even started getting his hair cut at home. Tailors brought in. Started doing yoga. Why? Because that's how gangsters live their lives, isn't it? He didn't really have any want for material possessions. After all, Reg was the one who could drive and who owned an American car. Ronnie could live out some of his childhood dreams. It was like a reinvention. And he had a new identity. A new persona. He was the colonel. And now he could act like it. Reg began to follow suit, no pun intended, and took on the gangster chic dress code. This had significance to the twins as a partnership. Where once it had seemed Reg was the dominant force, it was Ronnie who now emerged as the dominant twin. He was no longer reserved and awkward. Getting such a nickname as the Colonel was because of his drive. Now it seemed that Reg was in the back seat and was doing as Ronnie said. Reg strived for what he called the good life, meaning that he didn't see this lifestyle as a true retirement package. He wanted the respect, a showpiece wife, a nice car, comfort, the same goals the working man strives for. He did not consider his job as a long-term profession at all. In this instance, they were different. Maybe Reg was just in denial. All this may have been because of his want to be different to his twin, to have his own identity and prove that he was not dominated. Different desires would be something else that set them apart from each other. Then in contradiction, Reg started dressing the same, so on the outside they appeared to be as identical as they were in the pram all those years ago. To those who knew them, they had many personal differences, but visually it was important for them to look the same, to an extent, to act in a similar manner. It was all about image and presentation. To see twins dressing differently could hint towards conflict, and any suspicion of conflict between the crays would be seen as a weakness. Now they had a small team working for them. Knock-off gear was stored in the club for money. Little blags going on here and there. It was a small operation in a constant fight for recognition amongst the established underworld. By the time they were 22, they were making good money through all kinds of activities. But it was always small time. They wanted bigger goals. And it was to happen possibly sooner than they anticipated. The two major gangsters of the time were Billy Hill and Jack Spot Comer. They had formed an alliance to control the whole of the city and even called themselves the Kings of the Underworld. They had been ruling London for ten years as friends, but sure enough, they fell out and Spot had his face carved up in a vicious attack in what became known as the Battle of Frith Street. The odds were stacked up against Jack and he needed someone to turn to. He turned to the craze. 
He offered them a pitch at what would be an historical gangland event, the 1955 Epsom race meeting. The twins could barely tolerate Spot anyway, but took him up on his offer. The idea was that it would be a show of strength by Spot and would warn Hill off trying anything. They may have been there as his ally, but showed contempt towards the gang of both Hill and Spot. They were bored by the horse racing and showed no interest in the day, but at the same time showed no fear of anyone from either rival gang. These were the top gangsters in the country, and the twins' behaviour was insulting to them and implying that they were has-beens. It was the proverbial two-fingered salute to all of them. The Italian gang was also there to observe what was going on. If there was to be a war, they would certainly be interested in the outcome. Ronnie and Reg took their cut for the day's outing and returned home. It was obvious to everyone that they had treated the day as a chance to show everyone who they were and that they feared no one. Frankie Fraser was part of Hill's gang and was eager to fight it out with the Crays. If the twins wanted war, then Hill's gang would be ready for them. A date was set and the colonel prepared his army and gathered weapons in anticipation. This was the confrontation he'd been looking forward to for some time and now it looked as though he was going to get his chance. Both Hill and Spot heard about the battle and called it off. They'd always exercised control without the use of violence and had an understanding with the police that if violence was kept off the street, then they were okay to go about their business. It had been a good work in relationship. Spot kept the twins at arm's length after that incident. He was put off by their ruthlessness and wanted nothing more to do with them, but remained friends with them rather reluctantly. They wanted to learn from him and to take over the West End, wiping out Hill and his gang along the way. Spot, however, was not about to give his secrets away to anyone. The feud between Spot and Hill carried on, and around a year or so later, Spot was ambushed again, care of Frankie Fraser and Alf Warren. He called it a day soon after that, refusing the twins' help to rid the world of Hill's gang once and for all. Billy Hill also went into retirement, and the coast was now clear for someone else to step in. The Italians stepped up, and the rumours were that they were not happy with the twins after they had favoured Spot in the power struggle. If they weren't happy with that, they would have been even less happy when Ronnie strolled into a club one night with the firm in tow and took out a Moser pistol and fired at them. No one was shot, but a few Italian suits would be at the dry cleaners the next day. They challenged the Italians on their own patch, and they backed down immediately. It was a wise move. This had been the break that the twins needed, and everything seemed to be falling into place. Along with their firm, the twins were convinced they could fill the gap that Jack Spot and Billy Hill had left empty. It was now their chance to reign as kings. Ronnie, on the inside now as well as the outside, had become a fully-fledged gangster. If the Italians were the main competition, he and Reg would be unstoppable. It was their graduation ceremony. Real villains were now part of the gang, and that gang became known as the firm. Reason and calculated strategies would now need to come into play. They could not just fight for the hell of it anymore. In 1956, Ronnie shot someone for the first time. Knowing that he collected guns and had shot at people, it was certain that one day he would shoot someone for real. He was identified by his victim and charged with grievous bodily harm. The eleventh commandment, Thou shalt not grass was broken, but friends in high places and the powers of persuasion meant that Ronnie walked. He could have been wearing Teflon suits at the time because no matter what was thrown at him, it would not stick. Ronnie loved it. It was another victory in the battle against authority. If you keep getting away with wrongdoing, do you ever think about stopping? Not a chance. Neither did Ronnie but he also never gave a second thought to the consequences. 
The firm soon earned themselves the tag of the most dangerous mob in London and were getting money from all over the place in protection rackets, thieves and villains in the area offering them a cut of their action. Ronnie felt he was above the law, and in some ways he probably was, though not for long. In the same year, he led a revenge attack on a man and ended up doing time for it. He got three years for grievous bodily harm and found out firsthand that you can't get away with everything, certainly not all the time anyway. The commandment had been broken again, and it would be the last time as far as Ronnie's liberty was concerned. Inside, Ronnie lived a comfortable prison life, and Reg took care of business on the outside. This was the longest time to date that they'd been apart, which meant Reg could now be his own man to run the firm in his own way. He had seen the dangers in Ronnie's battles, but up till now had gone along with them. Fighting and shooting were certain to lead only to one thing, and Reg wanted something different out of life. He took on a shop in Boar Road, Bethnal Green, which was turned into a club and became their new base. A new drinking club, the Double R, standing for Ronnie and Reggie. So he hadn't forgotten about Ronnie altogether, but while he was in prison, Reg could live his life as he wanted to go to work as a businessman. Helped by brother Charlie, the club was becoming a huge success. Charlie had a good head for business, but would prefer to remain in the background as opposed to running with the gang. This way he could get on with running the family business interests and not worry about the criminal side, which worried Reggie. Ronnie's prison life soon took a turn for the worse and he was heading for a breakdown. His constant mood swings and disruptive behaviour was doing him no favours. But this all pointed to a medical condition that was much deeper than originally thought. This is the point that it is believed that the death of Auntie Rose led to a breakdown. He was sent to the psychiatric wing of Winchester Prison, where doctors declared him insane. Diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and his health deteriorating, Ronnie was moved to Longgrove Mental Institution in Surrey. At this point, he began to panic. He had seen his friend Frank Mitchell in a similar position, where he was to be held indefinitely because of his mental condition. Ronnie had begun to react well to his medication, but was still considered to be unstable for release. And so a plan was successfully hatched to get him out. The law back then stated that if someone escaped and was at large for more than six weeks, they would have to be re-examined upon capture and dealt with accordingly. This was what they had in mind for Ronnie. They needed him out long enough to be re-examined, declared mentally stable, and serve the rest of his time in prison, knowing he would be released. The twins concocted a ploy to beat the system, which was simple, but effective. Reg visited Ronnie one day, and they simply exchanged coats. Both were wearing the same suits, which meant Ronnie could just walk out while Reg sat at the table patiently. Minutes later, Ronnie was on his way to freedom. As the minutes ticked by, Reg sat in the visiting room, waiting to reveal his identity. When he was asked where Reg had gone, the people at the institution were baffled when they heard the reply. One of their patients had just walked out to freedom, so easily. It was their own stupid fault and had nothing to do with Reg, he told them as he walked out. The plan didn't run as smoothly as expected, though. Ronnie's mental illness worsened after he was hauled up in a caravan in the country after the escape. Reg moved him back to Valence Road to be with Violet, but his mood swings and eventual suicide attempt gave the family no other choice but to surrender him back to the authorities. They didn't like to do it, but it was their only solution and was for his own good. Fate decreed that he should be returned to Longgrove and after a thorough examination he was no longer certified insane. Bizarrely the twins' plan had worked. 
and Ronnie was moved to Wandsworth Prison to serve out the rest of his sentence. He was finally released in 1959. The mood swings were still there. The paranoia. He'd pierced the floor like a caged lion, ready to snap at any second. He was put on medication to calm him down, but there were side effects. His speech and walking slowed. He put on weight. This calm was just before the storm. Following that, just to top it off, Reg got an 18-month sentence in prison for his involvement in a protection racket. This left Ronnie with the reins to the Cray Empire. Up until now, he was unpredictable. But Reg had been there to smooth problems over and look after him when it was needed. Now Ronnie was dangerous, unpredictable, powerful and in charge of the firm. <laughs>